Are we are we gonna need the mic for the video end purposes, do you think? Yeah, okay. All right, well yay, thank you everyone for staying um, for this final hour of awesomeness. Um, as I gotta said, my name is Lisa Ringfield and I'm the director of the Sexual Assault Response Program and the Division of Criminal Justice, which is in the Colorado Department of Public Safety in the state of Colorado. I'm Kathy Holland, and I'm also with the Office for Victims Programs at the Division of Criminal Justice, and my most important role is that I administer the SAVE program, which we're going to talk about, but I wear a number of different hats at OVP with regard to the VOCA and VAWA and SAS grants. So welcome all of you, and thanks for sticking around. We're going to go through a number of different things today. The big picture, the legislation, and the history, both federal and state. The reporting options for Colorado survivors, the same payment program, and then we'll do a couple of case studies and hopefully have time for questions. <coughs> All right, so we um, were asked to do this presentation because uh, this is such an important issue, and as we have uh, over the years been out and about across the state, we have realized how few people understand and know what the reporting options are for sex assault survivors, and so we have heard anecdotally horror stories where um, police officers are arguing with um, sexual assault nurse examiners about the existence of some of these reports, or advocates who are unaware that there is a choice, that victims have choices. Um, so we're just trying to get to as many people as possible um, to share and reshare this information. So we strongly encourage you to, for the, the trickle down, um, process here to share the information you get today if any of it is new with your colleagues and with other folks who do this work so that we can um, spread the love. Okay, a big question comes up is who needs to know this information? And Lisa and I started brainstorming about it. Campus security and police, campus victim advocates, Title IX staff, student conduct, resident assistants, orientation staff, and on and on. And we actually decided that everybody needs to know this information, that from the student to the dean of students. Okay. And <laughs> sorry, we're not very smooth. Um, okay, so we're gonna start with the background to the reporting options and how they need to exist. So we'll start with federal law that, uh, and obviously the VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, has come up a couple of times today already. So there are two provisions, and Bree mentioned them earlier, or Bree mentioned one of them, um, and together they are known as forensic compliance. How many of you have heard of the term forensic compliance before? Like a few of you. Okay, so this is, that's a, like the, the term when we talk about these specific things, um, what we're referring to. So in 2005, um, this was when the provision in VAWA came in that Stated, victims do not have to work with law enforcement, enforcement to receive a medical forensic exam and that they should be reimbursed for the cost of that medical forensic exam. So that's provision one, right? That's in 2005 that happened. Then in 2013 in the reauthorization, the second piece to this puzzle is that it was determined that actually victims cannot be charged out of pocket for the medical forensic exam. So in 2005, they didn't have to cooperate with law enforcement to have an exam, but they would still end up paying for it and then be reimbursed. And in 2013, that shifted, and it was um, decided that actually, no, victims shouldn't even be paying. They should, you know, it shouldn't be a reimbursement process. They should just not have to pay out of pocket for the costs of the medical forensic exam. And additionally, and this is um, another piece to this, is that any state that is eligible for STOP grant funding, which is basically Violence Against Women Act funding, um, we, as a state, must coordinate with regional healthcare providers to notify victims of sex assault about the availability of medical forensic exams at no cost to them, right? So there is a provision in VAWA 2013 that requires that we are educating medical providers across the state um, so that they understand that they, they need to educate victims that these exams are available free of charge, right? That's the second piece, and that's one of the uh, few times that any kind of education and training has been mandated um, by law, right? That's often a piece that gets left out of many policies that are created around sexual assault, so that's a really important piece to know. Um, with regard to state, state law, 
There are three scenarios where that 21 days rule does not apply, and so that would be if the victim or survivor changes their mind and says, you know what, I don't consent to have my evidence tested, so then there would be no need to send the kit. If the allegation is proven false, or if the law enforcement agency who is in possession of the kit, who comes to the hospital perhaps to pick up the kit, they are not the law enforcement agency where the crime occurred, right? So like, Thornton picks up the kit, but actually the crime occurred in Brighton. Right, there's a little bit of um, space there for Thornton to be able to then get that kit to Brighton and then Brighton would send it in, right? So that would be, that's the flexibility with the 21 days. Any questions about law enforcement reporting? Make sense? Okay. Hey, the next reporting option is medical reporting. The victims and survivors can get the medical forensic exam they would give identifying information to the law enforcement agent, and it would be, like Lisa had said, that if the crime occurred in Denver, Denver police would come, even if the, the survivor was from the Western Slope. They, but this particular instance, if the victim or survivor is not wishing to report to law enforcement at this point. So the, they do provide the identifying information, and they can choose to have the evidence collected. They can choose up to two years down the road, but that evidence is collected. They can choose whether to have it tested or to not have it tested. And so the victim is really in charge in this situation. And the, the only difference between that and the anonymous reporting is that they must provide the identifying information to the law enforcement. And if they decide not to have the evidence collected or tested, then the kits are kept at a minimum of two years by that law enforcement agency. Uh, Any questions about that one? And, I'm gonna go on the road with the song and dance routine after this, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so anonymous reporting. So this is the newest one, right? This came in 2015. So medical reporting, 2008. We are almost at a decade of having medical reporting as an option for survivors in the state, and there are still law enforcement agencies, advocates, and folks who do not know that medical reporting exists. So that's troubling, right? So, and then anonymous reporting, March 2015, so we're just over about two and a half years, and very few people still know the existence of this option for survivors. So in this scenario, a uh, victim or survivor chooses, they do want to have a medical forensic exam, so they do want evidence collected, but they're not ready to work with law enforcement or engage in any way with the criminal justice system, and they do not even want law enforcement to have their name or identifying information, right? So they want to have evidence collected, but they don't want any information given to law enforcement at that time. <clears throat> So in this scenario, the evidence is collected and then the kit is given to law enforcement and it is stored for that two years, that minimum of two years. The victim or survivor in this scenario cannot choose to have the evidence tested, right? So medical reporting the one before, they get a choice. They can say, yes, please test my evidence at a crime lab or no, just store it. With anonymous reporting, they don't get that choice. It's just stored at the law enforcement agency in the jurisdiction where the crime occurred for a minimum of two years. Now, most law enforcement agencies will keep those kits to the statute of limitations, which for adults is 10 years, right? But after two years, they could legally destroy that kit if they wanted to. That would be um, fine for them to do. Oh, I think there was something else um, I wanted to say here, and I'm totally spacing what it was. Choose. Okay, it'll probably come back to me. Okay, yeah. okay so there is this um, inner section that I wanted to talk about related to domestic violence and sexual assault and a bill that was passed this legislative season that's really important for you to all know. So up until um, the, this, bill, this bill 1322 was passed, survivors who were experiencing sexual violence within the context of an intimate partner relationship um, were in a little bit of a bind if they saw medical attention. Because they would go to the hospital, the medical facility, perhaps for care of physical injuries that they had experienced from domestic violence. Um, and perhaps also they had experienced sexual violence in the context of that abusive relationship. Now the sexual violence piece 
is not reportable in the traditional sense, right? It's not a mandated report. The person can say that they want medical, anonymous, or law enforcement. They have those options. But domestic violence is a reportable, mandated reportable injury, right? So you have a physician or a nurse practitioner who would be working with someone who's experienced both domestic violence, mandated report, and sexual assault in the context of domestic violence, not a mandated report. So law enforcement get called, the person is likely experiencing trauma, they're having a conversation with law enforcement perhaps about the domestic violence and the sexual assault slips out, right? It comes out that they've also experienced sexual violence. So then they've lost the option to have that anonymous report for uh, sexual violence. Does that make sense, right? And so that was happening. Um, and so there was this kind of um, disparate um, impact or effect on survivors of sexual violence who experience that violence within the context of an abusive relationship. So HB 171322 um, did a couple of things. So this is effective August 9th, so in a couple of weeks. It took away the, manda the mandatory requirement that medical licensees report domestic violence. So a medical licensee now is no longer mandated to report injuries sustained through domestic violence well, as of August 9th, right? HIPAA still allows them to, but the state doesn't mandate that report anymore. So what, what this means for intimate partner sexual violence survivors is that they have access to all three reporting options because there's not going to be an accidental slip up um, in terms of identifying the sexual violence in the context of domestic violence, right? So the medical provider should be having a conversation with the person and saying, you know, what is it that you want to do, right? There are community resources available. Let me connect you with those resources related to domestic violence, related to sexual violence. You have these three options for sexual violence and I'm not gonna to report to law enforcement for domestic violence. Well, actually, before I get to that caveat, does that make sense to folks? Yeah? And this, so if you have health centers on your campuses, this is critical that they are educated about this piece, right? Because if they don't know, then they're gonna be making calls to law enforcement about domestic violence which they are no longer mandated to do, right? Okay, so the caveat here where it gets a little confusing is serious bodily injury, SBI, is a um, classification of injury that a medical licensee gets to decide what rises to that level. That is still reportable. So if a domestic violence victim were to arrive at the hospital and they had an injury that the medical licensee deemed rose to the level of serious bodily injury, then that would be a mandated report to law enforcement. There are also some other specific injuries that are outlined in that um, law at the bottom there, like dog bite, ice pick injury, I think there's like, it's a random collection of things out there, that are also mandated reports. Um, now the thing with serious bodily injury is it's left, left up to medical provider choice. So you can have medical provider A that says gunshot wound to the shoulder is not a serious bodily injury, and medical provider B who says gunshot wound to the shoulder is a serious bodily injury, right? It's not legislated the specificity of what injury rises to that level. So that's something um, that could potentially create some struggles in terms of determining what is and is not reportable in the context of domestic and sexual violence. Questions about um, HB 171322? Yeah? So, you just kind of answered it, but it seems obvious that they wouldn't use the statutory definition for serious bodily injury because doctors are sometimes asked to testify to that for the secondary assault. So, this is outside of Title 18's definition for serious bodily injury? Right, it's very, um, it's vague. It's not been clarified. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's still some, yes, there's work to do. Other questions? Okay. So the key piece um, to remember in addition that it's not reportable is that the provider, the medical provider is now um, required to give contact information for a victim advocacy agency in the community. So either give that information to the survivor or help them make the connection. Um, so they're not supposed to do nothing, right? They're not supposed to be like, oh, you're coming for domestic violence and sexual violence, but I don't have to report that anymore. Okay, see ya, right? That's not what's supposed to be happening. 
They're supposed to connect them with resources and then they are supposed to note that down in the medical record. Um, the theory being that if a person comes into the hospital multiple times for domestic violence and each time they're not interested in talking to the police, there's some record, right, of the fact that this has been a repetitious um, experience for them. So at the time that they decide that perhaps they want to go forward, then there's this documented record of all of this, it, um, these injuries that they've experienced. Medical licensee is still immune from liability if they do not report or if they do report, right? So the medical licensee, whatever they choose, is not going to be, they're not going to be held accountable for anything. So, and this is language, kind of legally language, when a licensee declines to report an injury that he or she has reason to believe resulted from domestic violence, pursuant to the victim's expressed preference, the licensee shall document the victim's request in the victim's medical record, right? So it's not, it isn't just you don't have to report, there are these other pieces to the law too that are really important. And the Colorado Coalition Against Domestic Violence um, led the charge of passing this law and so they will be providing additional technical assistance um, on it. But because of that in the section of sexual violence, we wanted to mention it here because it is um, an important change. All right, Kathy, you're up. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, so you said that there's, there's the HIPAA privacy, and this annotation is going to be in the, in the victim's medical record. So nobody will be able to access that other than the right. victim or the medical. Right, yeah, so HIPAA would still stand around what is, who can access the person's medical record. HIPAA still allows the medical provider to, to um, if the medical provider's like, I want to report this, then they can. They're, they are allowed to by HIPAA, but what they document in the medical, medical record As I mentioned, uh, the Sex Assault Victim Emergency Payment Program was established by the Colorado Legislature in 2013. And it passed unanimously, which says something about our legislators. And what it does, it will assist the victims or survivors with those costs associated with getting, obtaining that medical forensic exam. I referred to before, sometimes you go into the hospital and just walking in the door is going to be $1,500. Oftentimes there are medicines, there are antibiotics, anti-pregnancy, anti-nausea, those types of are typical charges that appear on a, along with the medical forensic exam. But I have seen bills that are just dumbfounding when you have like x-rays for a broken arm or stitches, those types of things, even MRIs for internal injuries. So that could run really, really high. So this program helps with those. Unfortunately, the spending authority is capped, so we have to put a cap on it, and it's currently at $2,000 per incident. So as you can see, that that eats it up. This is only for medical and anonymous reporting survivors. And, which is what I just said, and law enforcement is required to pay the cost of the medical forensic exam for anybody who reports. So if you have a survivor who reports day one, but then changes his or her mind later that week, we can't pay for it yet because they were initially reporting to law enforcement. So in that case, some of the, the victims' comp jurisdictions may pay for their extra costs, but it's Colorado has a decentralized victims' comp program, so it's up to one of the 22 different judicial districts to decide if they're going to pay those extra costs. And <clears throat> the SAFE program, it covers three types of costs as long as the funds for the program are available. First, the, the costs that I'll go along with just walking in the door and getting the exam itself. Two are the medical costs are with the injuries that may have been sustained during the assault. And like I said, I've seen some pretty horrendous bills that, that go along with this. And third, the cost of the evidence collection portion of the medical forensic exam. That is always paid. The survivor never, ever, in any circumstance, would be charged with that, that piece of what is done, the medical forensic exam itself. The SAFE program is the payer of last resort. And what that means is it would go to the patient's insurance company if the patient so chooses. And a lot of times they choose not to. If it's a college student, 
they oftentimes don't want mom and dad to see that come through on their insurance. So it's up to them. The, they could stop the payment at any time, or they, excuse me, stop the exam at any time and say which parts of the medical forensic exam they, they want and say no to others. And the same program would still cover that. And it, because as I'm sure you probably are all aware that that medical forensic exam is not just a, a quick and easy, let's grab the evidence. And the hospitals can never charge more than the, the negotiated rate. That So I'm sure you all have seen with your insurance companies that the doctors billed $12,000 for a broken ankle, but United Healthcare is only going to pay two. So we can never be charged more than what some commercial insurance company would pay. And once the exam is completed, the whoever the healthcare professional is who conducts the, the exam would fill out a payment request form, and that can be found on our website, which is included in your materials. And that would come to DCJ and to their own hospital billing records office. And once the, the evidence collection portion, that exam itself, is never billed to insurance. It's never billed to insurance, it's never billed to a survivor. The, the piece of it, if that is the evidence collection. All the other things that go along with getting that exam or those injuries can be billed to insurance and can be billed to us. And the, any of those additional costs, they go to first to the insurance, unless the patient says no, and after it's settled, whatever is remaining on the bill, what that medical or anonymous reporting survivor would get, would come to us. And the bill is matched up with the payment request form that came in from the healthcare professional. And it's a way for us to kind of put them together, see which hospital it came from, and to make sure that it's all tracking with what is being billed. And we have to have an itemized bill for each of the, the procedures that are done. And me not being a medical professional, I've learned a lot about different medications that I never knew. And Google is our friend. <laughs> and it, it covers deductibles and co-pays, which, as we all know, can be really high. And it will pay up to the, according to those program priorities, and now up to $2,000. We'd like to say that it's higher than that. 2,000 is usually enough to cover, but occasionally it's not. So we hope that the hospital writes it off, but we can't, we can't mandate that hospitals do that and we don't know what really happens to it and probably goes to the survivor. And any outstanding balance would go, it's really legally the responsibility of the victim. So hopefully the hospitals or the healthcare professionals will work with them on that. And this is our website, but it will be in your handouts if you want to see anything about this program or if you're a healthcare professional and you want to have access to that payment request form. So now we have a couple of case studies. And these are based on real life things. Yes? Before you go into that, I'm uh -huh. ask a quick question. Sure. I think I know the answer, but um, one of the issues that we talk about in dating violence prevention programming is that young adults who are still in their parents' insurance because they're under 26 don't want to get examined because they don't want their parents to find out that they were in right. that circumstance. So these uh, provisions only take effect if there's been um, evidence collected with respect to sexual assault, not domestic violence, correct? Right, just sexual assault. I just want to and, make sure. Okay. Yeah, okay. and then if Hopefully, the, and what we're trying to do is educate the medical personnel to make sure that the that this information is conveyed at the time and that the patient is not billed and if the patient chooses to not have the insurance bills, that they're given that option. But yeah, only for sexual assault survivors. Do we have any other questions before we go into these case studies? Okay, we have a, a college student sexual assaulted and goes to the closest ER for an examination. She probably will talk to her roommate, her friend. They don't know where the hospitals are and if they think to go to the healthcare facility on campus, they might get some better information. They go to the hospital that night. They, and this is how the patient goes to one hospital. That hospital has to medically clear them. They are back up those charges. The, you know, $1,500 for them to say, okay, you're, you're all right, 
medically, but you still need to have this exam, you need to go over to the medical center of Rockies to get your exam because that's where the same facilities are. So she's cleared by those first healthcare professionals at the ER, and then she goes to another facility for the medical forensic exam. She chooses medical reporting, the, that option. The same facility, let's just say Medical Center of the Rockies, bills DCJ for the medical the forensic exam, and the ER charges somehow from the first hospital she went to, she's never seen this bill, ends up in collections over it. So it ends up being because that first hospital didn't know they could bill us. They billed the patient because he or she was probably traumatized at the time at the hospital. So who should pay the ER charges in the long run? Yeah, exactly. But it's it, because the victim is medically reporting, and if the victim were reporting to law enforcement, then law enforcement would pay for those costs, and victim's compensation could pay for the rest of it. Yes? This is the victim's compensation question, so I don't have to know the answer. Mm -hmm. So the insurance thing with college students is a tricky point. So if they report to law enforcement, uh -huh. of course they don't pay for the medical forensic exam, right. and they don't want to use their insurance, so they don't give the ER their insurance, then they get the bill, and they give it to victim's comp, but victim's comp usually requires to be the payer of least resort that you must go through your insurance, where you all are going to require them to go through their insurance. Right. We won't. So is that, that true that victim's comp requires them to use their insurance? You know, I am not sure. Okay. And like I said, that the Colorado does have a decentralized program, and so what is true in Denver may not be true That's in Durango or Hugo and other areas. And it's also, from my understanding of victim's compensation, it's an application process, and the, the crime victim can be reimbursed. We can't reimburse out of this program, but the advantage of victim's comp is they have a much higher cap. I think theirs is $30,000 now. I mean, it's much higher than ours. They pay for counseling and a lot of other things, but they do have to be law enforcement reporting at that point, and some of them, will require that they're cooperating fully, some will work with them a little more. Yeah, it really does depend jurisdiction to jurisdiction, so it's really helpful for you all to have conversations with your victim compensation coordinator, whoever that is in your judicial district, um, because they're